Hello and welcome to Tech Deals, part 5 of the $1200 Ryzen 5 1600 computer build video series, Windows performance and RAM speed review. We are going to be testing a bunch of different programs in Windows today. We're going to be taking a look at general Windows performance. We're looking to look at video performance, CPU performance, general system performance, and what is the difference between DDR4-2666 and DDR4-3200. I have a half a dozen different tests tested on both of these RAM speeds that will be shown to you side by side later in the video. We'll be talking about the Ryzen 5 1600 CPU as it relates to most users, Windows, multitasking, and any non-gaming related tasks. In just a minute, I'm going to give you the short and sweet answer in case you don't want to watch the whole video, and then I'll take the long way around to explain how we got there. But before I do that, a couple of housekeeping things. Linked in the video description below will be the full playlist to this video series. Part 1 parts overview, part 2 is the wide vlog deep dive 1 hour and 47 minute video into this machine. Part 3 is the system build, part 4 just before this is the system setup where I first show you overclocking, updating the BIOS, installing Windows, installing drivers and all the good stuff. This is Windows performance and the next video in the series. Be sure to subscribe to be notified when that comes out will be game performance. Now, what's the short version? The Ryzen 5 1600 is all the CPU the average user needs. In fact, it's all the CPU that probably 90% of computer users need. It is even overkill for some people, although you will grow into it. And if you can afford it, I would recommend it as a base level CPU that should last you five plus years without any issue. It really is a great processor. For just over $200, you get six cores, 12 threads, 3.7 gigahertz. It should last you for a very long time. Now what's the short version on the RAM? Simple. Don't bother with the 3200 on a Ryzen 5. Get the 2666 unless by chance you get faster RAM at a discount. But do keep in mind that some faster RAM requires time and attention tweaking it and making it work. If you buy 2666, it works the first time, every time, no matter what motherboard, and it is really the easier option. As I said before, there'll be benchmarks later in the video, but really at this level, there is very little performance difference between these two types of RAM in this sort of machine. Links down below, below the full playlist, are going to be links to Amazon and Newegg for all the parts that go into this machine. If you find my video series helpful and useful, please remember to use those links when shopping. It really does make a difference. Thank you. Beneath those links, you'll find timestamps to let you skip around the video either now or if you come back to this for reference in the future if you'd like to just see specific parts. Down at the very bottom of the video description, you'll find my links to Twitch, to Twitter, as well as to Patreon if you'd like to directly support me in making these videos. A quick note about DDR4 memory before we actually get into the side-by-side -side performance comparisons. If you are building a Ryzen 5 anything, DDR4-2666 is by far the best value for the money. It costs less, it's more compatible, it's fewer headaches, and it just works. Currently, on the day that I publish this video, you can buy 16 gigabytes of DDR4-2666 for under $115. If you want DDR4-3200 that actually works out of the box in that particular motherboard, you're looking at over $160. It is not worth the $50 price difference in order to make 3200 MHz work. You simply aren't on a high enough end platform. Now, please note, I am aware that you can buy 3200 for less than $165. Not that works in that board, you can't. The Trident Z, the Rip Jaws 5 do not work at 3200 in that board. They have to be set at most to 2933. And the minute you do that, you've completely defeated the point of buying them. Now, I am aware that there are benchmarks showing that there is a performance difference on Ryzen between various RAM speeds. Many of those benchmarks are really comparing 2133 to 3200 or 2400 to 3200. I have tested all of these memory kits on three different motherboards. There is no single memory kit that is going to run at 3200 MHz on all the boards out there. Not even the excellent G-Skill Flare X RAM. It just won't. The time and the place to spend the effort and the money to get faster RAM? Ryzen 7 1700X and higher systems. Premium top of the line machines where you've already put in a better video card. You've already gotten a Ryzen 7. You're already buying a nicer motherboard. You've got liquid cooling or a large tower cooling. You've put money into all of that. 
and now you're ready to get faster RAM. Absolutely, I completely understand. Ryzen 5, don't bother. It is not worth the money. If you want to spend $25 to $50 more to try to get more performance out of your machine, this is not the place to put it. Buy a faster graphics card. Buy a faster CPU. Buy the 1600X and put an aftermarket cooler on it and get another 300 megahertz of CPU clock speed. That will get you more performance than a little bit faster RAM will at this level. One quick note on overclocking. All of the tests today were run at 3.7 gigahertz fixed on all the cores on the Ryzen 5 1600. And I did use the included Wraith Spire cooler that comes in the box. This is absolutely the fastest clock speed that I recommend using that cooler. If you have any troubles, any stability issues, if your system is getting warm or you live in a warm area, then you may need to set it to 3.6 gigahertz fixed instead of 3.7. It's not a major performance difference, but it is something to keep in mind. I do recommend that you stress test with ADA64. I'll show some of that towards the end of this video. If you do overclock your chip to make sure it's completely stable, 20 minutes at a minimum, I recommend running it for two hours just to be sure. And with that being said, on to some benchmarks. Here we are first running Cinebench R15. We are doing the CPU test first. You can see on the left hand side of the screen, we have DDR4 3200 and on the right hand side of the screen, 2666. You will see this pattern repeat multiple times throughout this video. Now, after giving that long speech about the various RAM speeds and what I recommend, you might say, why am I putting these in here? Well, the simple fact of the matter is I'm backing up my words with actual tests and I'm showing you a half a dozen of them to show you how little difference there really is. Here you go, the test is complete. For DDR4 3200, we have 1257. For DDR4 2666, we have 1246. This is less than a 1% performance difference. It is a rounding error, not worth worrying about. Now these tests do serve another purpose. You can run this, you can download this free test and run it on your own machine and compare it to this to see how much faster this is than your current computer. If your current computer gets around 600 and change, then this machine is twice as fast. If your current computer gets 300 and change, this computer is four times as fast and so on. The next test we're gonna run is still in Cinebench R15, but we're gonna run the OpenGL test instead. This is a graphics test. Now, of course, the graphics card you have is going to heavily influence the outcome, but this particular test tends to be more influenced by RAM speed than the CPU test. The CPU test largely fits within the level three cache of the CPU, which is why there's basically no difference in performance. This, there's a little bit more difference in performance. How much? Well, we're gonna see in just a minute. Now, just a side note, if you want more performance, $50 will buy you the GTX 1060 six gigabyte card instead of the three gigabyte card. The six gigabyte card is at least 10% faster than this is. The reason for that is the six gigabyte card has more CUDA cores, more actual processing power, and it will make a much larger difference in performance. Here, we have 114 frames per second with the 3200 and 112.74 frames per second on the 2666. Yes, there is technically a performance difference here, but it's a very minor one, 2% give or take, a little less than that. If you want more performance, buy a faster graphics card. The next test I'm gonna show you is CPU-Z's built-in benchmark. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have the 3200 megahertz result, and on the right-hand side of the screen, the 2666. These results are basically the same because this benchmark runs entirely within the level three cache of the CPU, and so it really doesn't care about your RAM speed. It is a worthwhile reminder that the only time the faster RAM makes a difference is if the program you're running is actually limited by your RAM speed. If you're limited by your CPU or your graphics card or anything else in your system, then the RAM speed doesn't matter. Your computer runs basically as slow as the slowest part that you put in it. The next test I'm showing you is the 7-zip built-in benchmark. 7-zip is a file compression decompression utility. Now this particular program does use the RAM because it's actually moving a lot of data in and out as it's compressing files. If you're compressing files and folders to either email them, upload them, put them on USB thumb drives, you're gonna be using large file sets that is going to use your main system RAM. How much performance difference is there here? About 1.8%. It is less than 2%. 
I've highlighted on the screen the total rating. This combines the compression and decompression numbers. You can see we're at 32,875 on the 3200 and 32,274 on the 2666. Want to see a bigger difference? Get the 1600X, run it at 4 gigahertz with an aftermarket $30 cooler, and you will see a dramatic performance improvement regardless of your RAM speed versus what you're seeing here. Now this next test is not tested between the two different RAM speeds because this is a hard drive test and an SSD test. It makes no difference what your RAM speed is for this. I'm including it simply for informational purposes for those of you who might be curious. If you watch part three, you'll note that I actually included two extra solid state drives in addition to the MX300 and the three terabyte drive that were included in parts one and two. Now these numbers are gonna be a little different than you saw in my recent which solid state drive should you buy. These drives have data on them. In fact, if you take a look at them, you'll see that these drives are all about 50% full. That does affect, well, the hard drive isn't, but it doesn't matter on that. Its performance is so terrible. That does affect the numbers somewhat. The results that I showed you on the which SSD should you buy video, the drives were all completely blank. Here they actually have data on them. However, the relative performance between the drives is still pretty much the same. The 850 Evo per the benchmark is in fact the fastest drive here. However, that Crucial MX300, as I noted in part four when I was setting up Windows, is unbelievably fast when actually installing Windows, downloading Windows updates, installing drivers. I have no issues or complaints with that MX300. I would absolutely buy it again. And I did, I spent my own money. That is not a review sample and I totally recommend it. Now the 850 Evo, great drive, but look at the current prices. It's a bit expensive. Now the Kingston A400, Buy it if you can get it at a good price. It's a good drive as well. I don't have a problem with it. I'm really happy with that MX300 and it's at the top of my list in terms of recommendations, even if the benchmarks don't say so. As a side note, look at the 4K random read and write speed of the hard drive. This is why there's two more SSDs in here. I actually have a number of the Steam and Origin games installed on the two SSDs. I simply don't use hard drives anymore. The performance is unacceptable. The real world use day to day between a hard drive and an SSD is such, it's sort of like going without indoor plumbing. Yeah, you can, but I'm not going to. That's what the two extra SSDs are for. Now I'm going to show you the ADA64 stress tests. This is all at 3.7 gigahertz. Please note that I've highlighted the three most critical things I want you to look at. On the left hand side of the screen is stock voltage, 1.24 volts. In the center, we're at 1.3 volts. And on the right hand side of the screen, we're at 1.35. It says 1.36, I had it set to 1.35. The purpose of showing you this is to show how small changes in voltage make large changes in temperature, fan speed, and power draw. This is not three different clock speeds. This is all 3.7 gigahertz. Let me repeat that. This is all 3.7 gigahertz. When changing voltage from 1.24 to 1.35, we have a nearly 20 watt power draw increase. We have a cooling fan speed increase from 1900 RPM to over 2300 RPM and a temperature rise from 72 degrees Celsius to 79 degrees Celsius. This is not increasing clock speed. This is what voltage does to your CPU. I know a lot of people say, oh, just throw some extra voltage at it. What's the problem? Well, it may not be, but I want you to be aware that this is what, this is just 0.11 volt increase over stock and it is making a dramatic change to noise, temperature, and power draw. Please note that the included Wraith Spire cooler is a 95 watt TDP cooler. It's meant to dissipate 95 watts worth of power. At stock voltage, we're absolutely fine at 3.7 gigahertz. This is fully stressed and fully loaded, pulling about 89 watts. We're okay, 72 degrees C. But if you set it to 1.35 volts, you are over 100 watts draw, you're nearly 80 degrees C, it's a little bit too much. Now, if your CPU requires 1.35 to get a good overclock, no problem, get a better cooler. The Wraith Spire is overloaded at this point. You can see the fan speed is up there over 2300 RPM. It's not that that power draws a problem. You can give Ryzen up to 130 watts of power safely, so long as the voltage doesn't go too high, but you need a better cooler to do it. 
What kind of cooler? A Hyper 212 Evo, a Hyper 612 Evo, even the new Wraith Spire Max, the 140 watt RGB cooler that AMD will be selling soon for $59. It's a little expensive at $59, but it is RGB and kind of nice looking. So you need a better cooler than the Wraith Spire if you want to run at 1.35 volts and at 3.7 gigahertz or higher. A to 64 is a free 30 day download. You can test it and evaluate it. I highly recommend you run this. If you're gonna overclock your CPU, monitor your temperature, monitor your clock speed, monitor your fan speed, monitor your voltage. Make sure that these numbers are all within reasonable limits before you start using your computer on a day to day basis. The next benchmark we're gonna look at is 3D Mark's Time Spy. This is a DirectX 12 test that stresses our CPU, our memory, and our graphics card. But because we are completely graphics card bound in this test, you'll notice that there is half a percentage point difference between these two results. 4186 on 3200, 4165 on 2666. Where would you see a larger Time Spy difference? A Ryzen 7 1700X at 4 GHz with a GTX 1080 Ti, then you would start to see a bigger difference, which is why I said unless you're on a top-end machine, don't bother with faster RAM, it's not worth the money. And now we come to the last benchmark, Passmark. Again, another one you can download for free and run on your own machine. You'll see here that I included all of the scores, the 2D graphics mark, 3D graphics mark, Notice the memory mark. That's where the real differences are. Because this is a synthetic benchmark and it does include a specific memory benchmark, the difference here is larger than in any of the other tests that I've shown. The overall pass mark rating is about four and a half percent difference here, but most of that is really in the memory mark. So if you are running a task that is completely memory bound, such as video encoding, then you would see a larger difference. But if you're video encoding and you're serious about it, you shouldn't be on a Ryzen 5 anyway, you should be on a Ryzen 7. This brings me back to my original advice. There really isn't much you'd be doing with a Ryzen 5 that deserves faster RAM because you should be better off buying a Ryzen 7 instead. You would get far superior performance in video encoding than you would putting your money into faster RAM. And so there you have it, lots of tests, lots of results. The conclusion, on mid-level systems, there is no serious performance difference between 2666 and 3200 megahertz. And we had an advantage on the 3200 here because it's running at CL14, whereas the 2666 is running at CL16, which is actually a rather slow setting for 2666. Lower is better on CL ratings, where of course higher is better on the megahertz rating. Quite simply, on mid-range systems, it is not worth the money to buy anything faster than this. Only if you're on a 1700 or 1700X overclocked with good cooling and the rest of your components are high-end would I suggest spending more money on RAM. But that will require investigation into which RAM will run on your specific motherboard. So if you're building such a high-end system, it's worth maybe a little bit more attention. A Ryzen 5 anything? Don't bother. 2666 great performance, great value for the money. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below, questions and comments in the comment section. As always, check out the links in the video description. The full playlist of this video series will be right there at the top. Then all the links to Amazon and Newegg for all these parts down below. Beneath that will be timestamps, and then beneath that are my general links to things like Twitch, Twitter, Patreon, etc. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.